Okay, it looks like we've got some folks have filtered in. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Robert Siegel. I'm the Vice President of Sales of North America for Connexon. And thank you for joining us today for Autonomous Robots to Lights Out Operations, How to Automate Your Intralogistics End-to-End. Uh, I am joined today by our esteemed panel of Tel Dengel, Tobias Borneman, and Stefan Biermeyer. We're going to walk us through a little bit more about what we can learn from our solutions and how they can help address the intralogistics challenges. Um, we're going to start by talking about the current state of logistics and highlight some of the challenges that organizations are faced with today. And we will then look at how you can solve some of those challenges from both an IT and an OT perspective and how external realities are affecting these organizations. So to get into the conversation, I'd like to start by asking Till to enlighten us on the current state of logistics. Till? Well, thank you, Rob. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Yeah, I wanted to kick off the session today a little bit with a background on how logistics has been evolving in the past couple of years and also give a little bit of an outlook where we think it's going. And it's it's been interesting. I've been in this field for a couple of years now. And um, of course, logistics was always focused very strongly on efficiency. And then came the pandemic and then suddenly everyone realized what happened. The supply chains are not moving. And then there was a much, much, much stronger focus on supply chain resiliency and agility and making supply chains more flexible. And now that we are in this past pandemic world, <clears throat> what we are seeing is that companies are now approaching us and, and what we see with these companies and what we hear from these companies, what they're trying to achieve now is basically to set up their supply chains for the future. And in, in my perspective, what, what's interesting and what we are ha what's happening and what we're hearing is three different um, themes, if you will. On one side, most supply chains and most warehouses around the world and, and supervisors are dealing with labor shortages, right? So it's very tough to get skilled labor, to get enough labor um, in, in your warehouses and in your operations. So that's one major theme that we hear around the world. And then people that are coming in uh, are digital natives, right? They want to deal with systems in a different way and they want to operate in a different way. So we have a new labor force on one side. On the other side, there is this trend for increased transparency uh, into the supply chain. And I think that certainly came through the pandemic. And of course, through the pandemic, we had a lot of venture capital flowing in this space, which on one side was fueling um, this trend towards transparency. A lot of visibility providers uh, are now in the market providing you know, by the minute um, status messages of shipments and of deliveries. And on the other side, a lot of venture capital was flowing into the space that we are discussing today. So really advanced automation and robotics, which now is really becoming mainstream and the norm in warehouses that we see. So I think that's the second big theme that we are seeing. And then the third one that is coming in is, of course, the big topic and the big discussion around AI. So now that you have all this visibility data and now you have all this data operational data and data, OT data coming from the warehouse and from the robots. And now you can put AI on top of that to really make things different, to really get advanced insight into the warehouse, to really do predictive analysis and to really change your operations in the warehouse. So I think it's a really interesting time to be in this space right now, just because all of these things are now coming together and they're reshaping um, the industry in my perspective. And I mean, if you go to the next slide, Rob, please. And um, what you see is that from an SAP perspective, we have also adjusted a little bit to that. So of course, our cloud ERP solution is still the center of everything we do. Of course, warehouse management, transportation, and visibility and, and tracking and tracing solutions are part of that as well as part of our advanced supply chain um, suite that we have. And everything is built on our business and technology platform, which is the underlying technology, including you know the connectivity, the analytics, the artificial intelligence foundation, um, and it includes the connectivity to the partner solutions that are either building on the business technology platform or that are connecting through the business and technology platform. And AI for us is always relevant because it, it is built into the business processes, into the workflows as we execute them um, across the logistics field. So that's that's a little bit the perspective um, from our side where, where logistics came from and where it's going. So just to jump in really quickly, I think we've seen some external data that supports what you've just said to us, Till. Um, this chart from Capgemini actually shows the black line on the bottom is the adoption that organizations have today, more than 50% of their processes activated with these different technologies 
versus the blue line where they expect to be within the next three years. And you can see there's some pretty big gaps there. You've talked about AI being one of them, we also industrial robotics, uh, robotic process automation. These are areas where we see massive investments today from organizations, because right now what I have seen working with customers directly is that so much of the supply chain and the manufacturing and assembly processes are very manual today. They know that to drive effectiveness and efficiency into their organizations, leveraging technology is going to be the path forward. Um, so, Till, this is what you've seen for SAP as well? Absolutely. Yeah, there's still a lot of manual warehouses. Of course, there is also, I mean, automation in the warehouse has been around for many, many years, but it's very static, right? So most of our customers that we are talking to, they run prototypes, they run pilots, or they have some warehouses already more advanced on, on robotics um, automation, but they are basically getting into, they're getting ready for the future and moving into this space. And I think the tricky thing, and that's what's depicted here on this slide, is they run, our customers run one or multiple ERPs, right? And then they have one or multiple warehouses, depending on their fulfillment operations and their setup, that are generating these transport orders. So that's basically what's coming from a demand side. But then on the supply side, and if you go to the shop floor, you have different kinds of uh, fleet management systems. You have MFS systems, right? You have more the, the static uh, material flow systems. You have on the other side, fleet management systems. Some of our customers connect directly to the robot. So without a fleet management system in between. And it's a very heterogeneous landscape because many times customers run different operations for different industries or different countries. So there is uh, not yet uh, a lot of standardization into that connectivity to the OT layer that is actually running in the warehouse. Um, and of course that brings some challenges with it. So this is a great place to stop for a second and to make this presentation a little more interactive. So I believe we're gonna have a poll that will come up now for the audience to let us know what some of the biggest challenges you are seeing today for automating of intralogistics systems. So that should be coming up now. It's in the bottom right hand corner of my screen. I hope it is for you all as well. You can see that answer the first question for us. Um, Tobias, while we're waiting for some of the answers to filter in, can you tell us a little bit, I know it's a little bit of a preview, but what you see as some of the challenges today for intralogistic systems? Yeah, so definitely we have, let's call it the old world, we have it the new world, and definitely the combination of both. That's exactly the point. Of course, the connection, the integration of new systems in already running high efficient systems that's exactly the point and also the whole intention of automation these are definitely the challenges which arise out of it and i will definitely tell some details afterwards then with our robot system that's one key enabler for this excellent that's actually it's what we're seeing right now in the poll result results uh first place integration with existing systems followed by high initial costs um, so these are some of the challenges we faced with today um, Till, I think we're talking a little bit more about this now as well, correct? Yeah, I think if you just click one more on the slide, you, you will see that that's exactly, it. I think, what, what's already stated, right? There is slow adoption, so scalability is difficult because there's so many different technologies to actually work with, right? There is, and this, this ecosystem in the robotics space is very rapidly evolving. Like, like I mentioned, there's lots of venture capital that's been flowing in this space. A lot of new players arising, all of them using you know technology in a little bit different way. And so that connectivity is, is challenging. Um, that brings with it a, a poor scalability. Um, inflexible robot fleet operations. So just if you imagine, I mean, we've seen warehouses that run different types of uh, different types of, of robots, right, for different purposes. Um, heavy utility type of things, or you know, faster robots, um, sometimes um, yeah, just cross-docking type of operations, all of them requiring a little bit of a different uh, hardware and robots to use. But just imagine bringing all of that together that it all runs smoothly in addition to all the forklifts and all the manual you know, labor force that's in the warehouse. I think that's the challenging piece. And the last point is, of course, the lengthy IT integration process as you have different fleet management systems or like, um, like mentioned that you connect directly to the robots and that also keep evolving very quickly. So I think just having the, the IT um, department ready and to, to make all those integration and build Build what you need um, is already a challenge too. So uh, we have one more poll here on this slide as well uh, that we'll bring up for you to talk about how many uh, different mobile vendors you're using today. Um, and I, I will talk about that. my experience again has been that I was surprised at how much organizations feel locked into specific vendors once they start with one. 
Um, and it sort of takes away their ability to pick and choose the right type of AMR and the right solution for different OT challenges they face on the shop floor. Um, that's why this topic in particular is very interesting to me because it's about enabling people to find the right solutions for the challenges they have at hand. Um, I'm actually, the results we're seeing right now, one to three being the most popular, three to five, uh, second most. It's, the results I would expect to see in this type of scenario because people are dealing with vendor lock-in today um, and trying to not manage multiple uh, fleet management systems today as well. All right, so I think now we will ask Stefan to tell us a little bit more about uh, your view. Yes, I, uh, perfect. Thank you, Rob. Um, I, I think especially when 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 listening to to uh, to Bia's uh, and also Till's first kind of elaboration of of the challenges, I think two things for me um, were standing out. The first one is uh, the the lack of skilled labor, um, and I think also from my experience, I think that is even getting worse, unfortunately. Um, and uh, the other thing is the connectivity um, and the connectivity with regards to complexity in implementing IT systems. And um, that full stack and also what we see on the, on the right hand side of the, of the slide is again, getting that full stack from the operation and really shop floor physical level um, to the IT layer. And that in a very easy, scalable way is, is, is one of the key challenges we're addressing, especially when dealing with multiple different technologies uh, and technologies for that regard especially in the context of our fleet management with the path towards, as we, we call the webinar light, lights out um, operations, is that you need to automate and finding a solution which is really connecting these layers and these two worlds, I would say, from a physical to digital world is one of the key challenges where especially the Kinexon fleet management solution as an agnostic fleet manager is coming into place um, where we're really creating that bridge between physical and digital world to actually aggregate both, I would say, north and southbound borders, let's say, and achieving greater efficiency through through these operations and, and, and really streamlining all that. And that is creating, from our point at least, um, the scaling and the scalability, which needs to happen, especially with regards to the full automation and then having that entire stack with an EWM uh, on an SAP side, but in general, a warehouse management system going down, transport orders being executed and orchestrated in the most efficient way, because that's then the part we need to be more um, how to say, uh, efficient and more more flexible. Um, and that bringing them back um, when, when Tobias is a little bit more, more elaborating on the physical shop floor with the AMR is for me the challenge. And if you uh, click one, one slide further, I think I somehow highlighted already um, the three different types of um, of bullet points I wanted to, to mention is the highly efficient transport and mobile operations, which is necessary to really get out the full efficiency of an operation, especially when we talk about the path to light out operations, because you won't stick with one vendor, you won't stick with an underwriter, you will have a stacker, you will have a tagger, so you will need to mix the fleets on an OEM side, but also uh, on a functional side. And if we um, Put that further on the on the next slide. I think something which is very important is to to create that kind of um, scalability in the first side um, and to control and manage heterogeneous fleets uh, to make them really um, efficient um, and especially that using um, standards, for example, like the VDA fifty fifty um, is is one key element to drive that operations. Uh, Rob, could you could you just quickly um, skip to the next slide? Then then uh, yeah, perfect, exactly. Um, so this is where, where I can really elaborate. Then where the advantages are to create these kind of I'm always calling it an orchestration unification layer. It's not a middle layer because a middleware is just passing and processing and passing through data. No, that's that's not exactly, it's more or less the excellent, uh, ex actually the opposite. It's a unification and execution orchestration layer to control and manage these heterogeneous fleets um, in the market, which we're seeing more and more, and especially customers are now more and more thinking of, okay, I might select first in my automated operations on a fleet management and then going without making compromises on the actual manufacturer I want to use for my operations. And that based on a standard like the VDA 5050 makes it even better from a customer perspective because it's a customer driven standard and it creates 
the um, opportunity for you to really scale without discussing about integrations, integration efforts, and so on. You have also, that is also what we discussed and what we've seen is you're not longer operating in silos. You're really unif unifying your operations um, and you can save money on maintenance. You can save money on trainings because you will have one system to operate with. And one key element is the scalability across sites with a solution which is intuitive and can really help you by applying to all the different challenges you have, especially when coming across the situation that you're looking for labor and you're looking for skilled people, um, which is one of the biggest uh, challenges I think we have. And to complete that picture, um, I would I would uh, have a look at uh, Tobias, because especially when you look on the lower, I would say left side, uh, where the continental robot itself is representing the shop floor layer, I think it's completing the entire view of having an ERP WMS system on, on the SAP side, um, where we still need to have this kind of connectivity to the shop floor, then um, in between the Connection Fleet Manager or Connection General with its connectivity solutions, and then completing that entire picture also with the view of an, of an OEM um, to share then the full picture and getting into the lights out um, operations. And then Tobias, I would just simply hand over to you to give us your perspective on how the orchestration of, of robots uh, is impacting the business. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Stefan. Um, but maybe before we jump into the technical topics, I would like to share with you why Continental. Of course, Continental mainly known for our automotive products, but that's exactly a big advantage. So we also have the perspective on the one side, of course, from our operative level, uh, level where we have the production plants. There are also uh, the logistic needs but also on the other side of the competencies. And we see it here. So mainly Continental is divided in three group sectors. So we have the automotive sector, we have the tires sector, where of course Continental is mainly famous for, for our automotive tires and also Conditech. With our Continental mobile robots, we are located in the safety and motion department. And yeah, it is an, individual product center. We are not only active in um, the field of intra logistics, also in the field of agriculture, but especially from our competencies from systems engineering and also autonomous uh, driving. Uh, we definitely can use the uh, synergies for uh, mobile robots as well. We are active in the market since more than five years and yeah, looking forward to share with you in the next slide, then our philosophy and our interpretation of being a strong partner at the shop floor for our customers. And we already talked about the challenges, uh, sketched by Stefan, sketched by Till, also Robert um, shared it. In the whole context of automation and uh, especially in the intra logistics, of course, the vehicles, we call them, of course, mobile robots are the key element. And we are definitely um, convinced on our side that um, the use cases challenge us not just in one dedicated um, form of transport. We have different players at the shop floor and they have a reason that they are there. Yeah? Maybe we need floor to floor transportation. Maybe we need underwriters. Maybe we need small load carrier transportation. The different transportation tasks at the shop floor which have to be managed by the operating system and then uh, by the customer in the end. But we also have to pay attention that the customer is, uh, of course, at least at the most times, not the expert in automation, not the expert in mobile robots. He also consumes this as a kind of service. And therefore, we are convinced to go there on a partner level together with the customers also here around the players in this call with SAP and then also Kinexon. And key from our perspective is being open, flexible, with scalable solutions. Because also shown here as different challenges, we talked about finding the right robot. Maybe if we're just focusing on one manufacturer of a robot, its portfolio is limited to one or two robots. They maybe do not match for the use cases I have at the shop floor. Then also, of course, I also sketched the 
main business is definitely not the automation uh, of the intra logistics. The main Business is producing a product where intra logistics is a vehicle on the way too. Therefore, also the system understanding needs strong partners to support. The integration we also sketched also out of the poll. Uh, uh, we worked out that uh, this is definitely currently, and I mentioned it already, with the combination of old world, new world, software integration, physical integration, then also software integration, definitely a big challenge. Um, and in the end, and that's the very important point, the operating service is in the focus, not the technology, not the solutions, not the AI in the background. In the end, the solution has to work and has to serve intra-logistics and transportation value for the customers. And currently, I think everybody in this call, I just switched to the participant list from the organizations you are joining transformation is ongoing everywhere and therefore what we're defining today we also have to pay attention that we do not narrow our view and should be open also in the future for adaptations and therefore i'm also convinced that our ecosystem we should integrate should not focus on the status quo we should always leave our view open for a future adaptation and therefore some words because this was mainly also worked out already in the previous discussions on the next slide we can see this as an overview mainly the big question and very often the elephant in the room should we go to proprietary solutions or on the other side open solutions and i just share with you my personal uh, view and also the view we have at continental mobile robots on the left side of this chart we see the individual solutions individual for individual robot suppliers um, as i already said yeah limited then of course if we have proprietary solutions to the technologies we could combine with the individual standalone systems we also have to pay attention that we come to limits we talk about automation it's not a one-day task it's a task of the whole future we are focusing and that's exactly the point um, we're uh, becoming more and more complex more and more flexibility at the shop floor and therefore also as key point mobile robots with large and also heterogeneous fleets to serve the individual transportation needs um, and that's exactly the point not only and very often we also limit if we have one project we have to fulfill for automation with a view that we have this just um, isolated but in the future it's not just integrating the software or integrating a system we also have to think about the physical layer yeah we cannot let individual robot fleets in the future run completely physically isolated or maybe with big 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 workarounds we have to do physically on the junctions on the crossing points and so on and so on and also in the next to each other um, operation and therefore from our perspective key element is that they know of each other and that we have um, holistic vda 50 50 based communication protocol based on a fleet master control system which has the overview about all the different layers and just shown you on the right side uh, we also have a maximum flexibility we do not limit ourselves today to a special product to a special mobile robot to a special intra logistics configuration we are open we can change it also in future times and also that was one point stefan worked this out already freedom to choose the best solution also in my history i had very often the situation still on operation side that we had to do workarounds and i'm not a friend of doing workarounds when we are aware of the best solution and that's exactly the point still keeping this flexibility and also this openness to take the best solution integrate them even it's not from the supplier i'm currently already having in, in my fleet but having this as an option that's a big advantage yeah. and that's exactly the point um, we also uh, 
brought then to our business model? Maybe you click one step further. Well, actually, Tobias, can I ask you a quick question here yeah, sure. on this slide? So as you're talking through this idea of people using proprietary systems versus a standard like VDA 5050, from an adopter's, a customer's, an organization's perspective, I mean, do you feel like the right-hand side of the screen, the standard, actually eliminates friction inside the organization? Because as you're talking through it, I can hear an OT group saying, I need various vendors to find the right solution, the right robot for this particular job. And IT groups that are sort of, they're want to standardize on a single fleet management system, but finding a standard like VDA 5050 allows them both to get the best of both worlds. Have you seen the same thing? Definitely. So this is also a good summary from your side. And I think everybody is aware about the situation. We have to do decisions today, but they affect and impact the future. And especially currently in this transformation process we're currently in. And we always talk about this VUCA world, of course, volatility, uncertainty, and so on and so on. Yeah? But that's exactly the point, especially in the area where the value creation happens. And this is the shop floor. The change has the highest impact. And there also in the future, I'm definitely personally convinced that many changes will happen in the context of smart factory industry 4.7. AI integration and so on and so on. And that's exactly the point, keeping the options open with taking the best solution, using the best technology and having the advantages, being capable to control everything at a glance and distributing the individual intralogistics transportation um, task then to the corresponding robots, which can be applied accordingly. Thanks, thanks to me. appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly the point. Uh, so maybe also from our background, maybe somebody raised the question in its head, uh, why continental and why, uh, why mobile robots? Of course, I already mentioned it. We felt the same pain. So the challenge is definitely. So I do not want to repeat it again. Lack of forklift drivers to do the transportation in the intralogistics. We have the challenging situation uh, with na narrow ales, also mixed traffic. And the mixed traffic is one important thing that we have to get rid of the perspective, putting an isolated robot system in any hall and nobody will touch it again. Yeah, that's exactly the point. But again, we also said in the past efficiency was important. If you go now to your supervisor and your plant manager and tell them, yeah, we now have each and every flexibility, but we do not care about efficiency. That's also not the way. Also, and that's the point we are focusing with our solutions and also with the partnering, for example, of the fleet master control, highest efficient solutions, yeah, which are then customized and orchestrated according to the needs. And then, of course, I already said it, the future system demands, keeping this flexibility with highest efficiency. And then uh, the, I'm convinced that with this approach I sketched and we discussed here, also in the future, our configurations and our systems still have validity and also create the biggest value for our customers. And that's also our philosophy. And with this, I um, would uh, like to Step to the next slide. Our philosophy. I opened um, my speech with this, and I also want to highlight this here. So we do not interpret ourselves just as a robot manufacturer who are throwing the robots on the market and afterwards we do not care. We are convinced, especially in the setup of our intra logistics um, ecosystems, that a robot manufacturer is one player on a common partnership. The partnership on the one side from the integration into the warehouse systems, for example, SAP, with the control of the fleet master controls, for example, Kinexon. And as you see it here, we see ourselves starting from the left, already integrated in the consultative sales. We develop together with our customers because very often we realize that, the, of course, expert knowledge is not at this level it should be, but that's okay, fully okay. It's not their core business. Yeah? We support them to, uh, to develop a business model, have our technical solutions in the middle of the slide with our partners like Inex and SAP and so on and so on and so on with all the advantage of connectivity, cybersecurity. Do the full integration and the launch with 
a worldwide network which can support our customers. And also that's a very important point. If you have any issues later on the shop floor with a worldwide available after sales. And we discussed it a lot in the beginning and we are convinced that also with our use cases, we already applied worldwide that this is the right strategy to serve. And I repeat myself there, the maximum value for our customer. And not talking hypothetically, uh, okay, here we see um, then the structure again. So it's mainly what was already showed in the initial um, slides. We have on the highest layer, of course, I call it IT layer with the SAP and then the extended warehouse management. We already aligned that we do not want to talk about middle layer, Stefan. So as one important decision layer, and that's exactly the point, the intelligence also at this point at the fleet master level, where the management from the Kinexon fleet manager can um, act um, accordingly. And then based on these decisions and based on the algorithms which are behind, then the dedicated transportation needs are then sent to the shop floor, to the mobile robot layer. And of course, here at this slide, you can see just continental mobile robots. If the use cases can be fulfilled with them, that's absolutely fine. But we are also open being integrated into already existing fleets or integrating maybe also other robots in continental fleets. We are able to do this because we are open with VDA 5050 based on the proprietary fleet master like Kinexon. And I do not want to talk hypothetically. I really want to show you on the next slide real figures um, that, for example, um, in one of our applications, this is in one production plant um, in Slovakia, we worked together with Kinexon, um, integrated this system uh, and brought our robots as a fleet in operation. And if we just look here at the little table with the, let's say, key facts, we have in the first line, the material handler. So the material handlers um, are in general, the devices which are active. So we need for doing this transportation, we have here pallets with iron casted metal on it, six mobile robots. On the already existing system, we had four forklifts, manual forklifts. Going to the second line, we have the operators. We just need two operators to do the, for example, maintenance, to being there in the worst case for control or maybe some adaptations. For the forklift system, we need, of course, at the forklift, four physical forklift drivers. For the invest, we calculated against the mobile robots because we said, hey, we have to do a new invest for about um, a half a million euros. The forklifts are already there. This is pro forklift calculated. And the labor costs due to the reduction of headcounts, we have, of course, a um, uh, reduction also in labor costs. And from the running costs with the AMR system, basically acting fully electric according to the uh, hydraulic systems like forklifts, we were also becoming cheaper. And bringing all these facts together, calculating it in the sum and also looking what is the result, we really had to break even with this project less than two years, one year, 11 months. And if we calculated the return on invest after five years of 262%. And what are the savings? This is then also very important per year, about 260,000 euros in this context. And this is not hypothetically, these are not figures which are just created out of the, I do not know, data creating machine. These are real facts out of the shop floor. And we just want to make them transparent also potentially Think about automizations based on mobile robots together with the fleet master control system, fully integrated into an SFP EWM system. So I love the example of walking us through not just hypothetically what's possible, but how you have actually implemented these solutions, the cost savings, the challenges you've dealt with. So I really appreciate you walking us through that as well. Awesome. 
Thank you, Tobias. So I, I have some questions for you all. And then we've also got some questions, I think, that are coming into the queue. So this is our question and answer session. If, they, if you all in the audience have additional questions, please, by all means, send them in. Uh, I do have one more poll I'm going to ask you all. Um, so we've talked about sort of the, the current state or the, the as is state, which is that there are challenges today because everything is very manual and that we're moving towards a more advanced and evolved state with the supply chain and logistics of leveraging autonomous robots, of leveraging uh, you know, these central systems. We also now have to look at the future. And Till, you talked about this a little bit, Stefan, you as well, thinking about artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm going to ask Till a question, but for the audience, I think there's one more poll if we can bring that up for the audience to take a look at as well. Um, Till, can you talk to me a little bit more about how you see artificial intelligence factoring into the factory of the future? Yep. So it's, I mean, one thing is what, what I find super interesting is that with, you know, the, the robots and everything that we just talked about is we, we get a whole new level of, of data into our operations that we never had before, right? To optimize future operations, to see patterns, to detect, you know, things where, where that we can improve. So I think that's that data layer that's going to be fueling um, the future for everything. Um, we see um, artificial intelligence, especially in logistics and in the warehouse, in three different areas. One is, I would say, more on the supervisor level, which is really bringing insights and intelligence from those operations to the operators so they can operate um, the warehouses in the future more efficiently. Um, the second area of use cases we see are really at the operational level, right? So really automating business processes so that uh, there is no human intervention um, needed or that the system makes a proposal and then the human can look at the proposal and then execute. So I think that automation potential, there is a lot. I mean, we have multiple different use cases that we are currently working on in automated document processing and visual inspection, for example, and other areas. And then the, the third area where, where we see artificial intelligence coming in is and actually the, the system setup and the system configuration, right, which is also a very manual task still today, which I think there can be a lot of automation also happening in the future by the machine just, you know, gathering data from, you know, different, different areas, from the, the system help, from past operations, from best practice templates, and bringing all of that together and helping how to set up and to connect the systems. So it's really those three different layers on the supervisor level, the insights, on the operational level, and then also on the setup level. Now, it's, it's interesting, the, the poll results show that more than half of uh, the respondents are interested in actually exploring AI applications for AMR operations. Um, well, about 40% have no plans. And I'm, I'm curious if some of that has to do with the complexity of it and I guess the challenge of not knowing where to start. AI is a ubiquitous topic everyone talks about, it, but how do we go do that? Um, Stefan, do you have any idea of like how people could today leverage AI? You want me yeah. To jump yeah. For you? I yeah, I think actually I can show it to you. It's uh, as we, as we normally right. So as as Tobias also said about it, it's not about just theoretically. Um, it's literally then how it can look like, um, and that is how to, as you said, making AI tangible um, using the data we are generating in in in, in a tangible way to really get. Um, effort and not to, to get actually to minimize efforts and get insights out. So that's why we decided from a connection perspective to add a AI feature, which is first of all, a gen AI part, which we decided in AI docs, AI config and AI analytics. Um, and especially on that analytics side that uh, we can really like with native language ask, and it's based on chat GPT four. So it's really like what you are normally familiar with a gen AI perspective, like the SAP jewel um, is like a or the co-pilot from uh, from uh, Microsoft, but it's kind of exactly the same stuff is that you can ask what happened, show me uh, anomal anomalies, um, show me uh, outliers, um, show me what's happening, but it's not only about the statistics, it's really about, and that's what I mean with tangible to act upon. Um, and that is also with AI, and that is especially the AI config um, is that you can actually tell the system what to do. You can say set a area with uh, tomorrow being active from eight to five because, and I would say an electrician is coming in to set up the new uh, wiring, for example. 
Uh, and um, that disabled zones mean that the robots, for example, from Continental, are in that time perspective from eight to five, not allowed to pass through that area and we re rerouting them. And that is not only then you drag and drop and, and, and draw some stuff, you just simply write it or even speak it when you have a microphone. And that's the way how we would adapt AI to really make it tangible and not only like an IT layer um, abstract stuff to so really make it tangible by actively using it, especially when talking about labor shortage and skill labor shortage is like texting and with native language, making that tangible, I think is one of a, is a really great example. And um, actually it's really like um, leveling up uh, the fleet management with the next releases. I love the way we've talked through that already, right? There are these different ways that we can make use of AI. I, I tend to think of it the way you described it, which is the generative AI, where someone can engage with the, the AI model, like you're seeing here on the screen, um, but also making use of the data until I think you touched on this a little bit, right? About talking about how do you make use of the data and using things like Juul to actually leverage that and make better business decisions and meeting our customers where they are in terms of solving the problems they have in front of them today. Um, all right, so I have another question for you, actually, Stefan. Um, the question comes from the audience. Uh, does that mean that the Connexon Fleet Manager acts as a direct unified fleet management software for different AMRs instead of linking up with individual brands AMR fleet managers? Yes, I, I, would, I would just simply say you can you can replace the question mark with an exclamation mark because it's, exact, it's exactly how it's uh, to be understood. Um, we are exactly acting like that. Um, and yeah, replacing fleet management solutions in one or the other way, um, especially on a continental side where we really have an in-depth integration is where we really directly speaking, we can also talk for other companies like Omron or Mir, for example, even they, if, even if they are not VDA 5050 compliant, we can directly talk to the AMR and bringing everything together on one single layer. It's exactly how I meant it. So perfectly understood and just replace the question with an exclamation mark. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Stefan. Um, all right, so my next question is for uh, Till and Tobias actually. Um, so, uh, sorry, I lost my question. So why uh, is there an interest in pursuing a partner strategy versus trying to solve these challenges completely on your own until you're off of mute? So I'll ask you that question first. All right. And I, I had to smile when um, when Tobias was presenting, right, because we are following a very similar strategy. So we we try to stay open and we try to stay agnostic. And the reason for that is it's a very rapidly evolving field, right? There is many new players, many different technology in play. And our customers are asking us to stay to stay open because there's so many different use cases um, that require that openness. And then there was one other statement which I actually noted down from Tobias saying um, the vehicles are the key element, right? So for us, we are a software company. And what we're seeing here is that everything in this robotics field is very hardware centric, right? Managing the fleet, connecting to the robot, knowing the status of the robot, knowing the health status of the robot and things like that. So it's very hardware centric. And that's why we concluded it's uh, it's better for us to stay open and to work with different players, like what connects on Continental here, right? To, to really stay as open and as agnostic as possible. Yeah, I can definitely um, definitely say also from my side. So things are really getting more and more complex and we are also convinced, of course, in the end, the maximum value for the customer means realistic, reliable, um, intra-logistic management and transportation is in the focus. And therefore, individual competencies have to work together. Otherwise, we won't be successful to manage the complexity and also the future development, which is still ahead of us, I'm definitely convinced of. And therefore, bringing all competencies on one table serves in the end from the expert perspectives, maximum value for our customers. And that's exactly the point. All right, wonderful. So I'm gonna ask you all one last difficult question. Fair warning. So I would like to know how your organizations are gonna support our customer organizations that are moved towards lights out operations. You can highlight one or two things that you think are most important for them. So until you're at the top of my screen, we'll start with you. Say again, sorry, I didn't get the last sentence. So if we could, if we could help, uh, you could help our, our attendees understand the one or two things that SAP 
would most like to highlight in terms of driving our customers towards lights out operations? All right. So I think what, what we can bring, right, is starting with the picture that I had in the beginning, right? We bring you the enterprise software and we bring you the warehouse management software and the technology layer on our business technology platform that can grasp all the data from the underlying um, solutions, all the underlying applications, but also from, from the robotic systems, for example, and that, that layer in between that we talked about. And bringing all of that together and then deploying AI on top of that, I think that will lead us into lights out operations where the AI will basically start driving and supporting the users um, in the end. Thank you, Tobias. From Continental Mobile Robot side, I can definitely say providing a reliable and robust robot system based on strong partnerships and following our philosophy, making things easy. That's exactly the point, which is in the end, then also the most important factor for the customers. Thank you, Tobias. Stefan? Yeah, I, I would say that especially like building the bridge uh, between those those two, the, the, the physical shop floor with, with a Continental and um, the IT layer on, on SAP side, bridging that is how we um, help the customers to, to go to light out, uh, lights out uh, operations as that is somehow missing and doing that in an agnostic scalable way without dealing with many different things on maintenance contracts, uh, silos, what we normally call them in, on a ver vertical perspective. Um, these are the two topics I, I would highlight from a scalability as well as a bridging perspective. Awesome. Thank you, Stefan. So with that, I would like to thank uh, Till, Tobias, and Stefan for joining us today. Thank you all very much. And especially to our audience and attendees for joining us today, providing your insight, answering our polls, and asking questions. So thank you all very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a good one.